We are recording now. And links to the notes in the chat. Yeah, given the number of security people who are in this call, it's uh, always amazing that we still run into the same problem. Yeah. Did anyone send anything to um, IATF Action? Not yet. Okay. We should. Um, if you want, I can do that. Please. Thank you, Sean. I just messaged uh, ISG to see if this is only a, our problem or if other groups are having the same problem. Uh, somebody's got the special button. I'll leave it to Francesca. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a TAPS meeting in an hour, which will, might run into the same problem, but maybe they use something different. I think Model T yesterday was WebEx. Yes. And I saw Colin with his real name. That was kind of surprising. How did he do that? <laughs> he, he deleted a lot of cookies out of his cache. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Jim had done a very smart thing. He had logged in and for the ACE working group, and then he had changed the name. And instead of being ACE working group, it was Jim Shad, but it was actually <laughs> the, the ACE working group account. So Christian should also join soon. Oh. Okay, at least anyone that raised the alarm uh, is also here. So I think we can get started. And we're recording already. So. Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, inter-meeting of the core working group. Uh, on WebEx today. Uh, I am Marco Tiloka, my co-chair is Jaime Jimenez, and this is an official ITF meeting, so uh, the note well applies. Be sure to get familiar with it if you're not already. It's not just about IPR and patents, but also about our uh, code of conduct and especially about it, so be nice and professional with each other, please. And the agenda for today is about going through a status update for the uh, uh, two uh, undergoing work core conf documents. Uh, that's going to be Karsten and Michael. And updates also on the HREF document uh, for all the three of them uh, really out of activities from uh, design team meetings. And then we continue discussing some uh, recent open points also raised on the list about the kudos document key update for OSCOR uh, also recently adopted. Does anyone want to bash the agenda for today? If no, uh, we can go on with uh, CoreConf. Uh, Carson, do you prefer to share or should I? Well, I can share that it makes the switching. Yeah. 
fart star, but I first have to navigate the weird way Chrome and WebEx interact here. Take your time. Well, I will have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, I will briefly talk about CloudCon and CI. I'm not sure we, we will need a lot of time here, but a lot of things have happened, so it's uh, probably worth going uh, through this. So I, I started with CloudConf. CloudConf, as you know, it contains uh, four drafts, uh, and two of those uh, we decided to expedite for a definition of expedite, uh, and these are in the ISG post telechat. Um, and the other uh, two have passed working group last call, but uh, are waiting for a shepherd write up, which we probably should be doing when the results from pushing the first two documents uh, through the ISG are in. Um, so, what do the two drafts in, in the ISG do? Well, <clears throat> our current plan is to do the discuss clearing first and then go to the comments, except maybe for the discuss wielding ADs where, where it's just convenient to address the comments at the same point in time, because it's not always easy to, to separate these out. So uh, Yang Siba is at dash 17 and has uh, one discuss remaining from Rob Wilson. And the status correctly is revised ID needed because we, we still need to do one thing uh, to actually address uh, the last discuss on the list, uh, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And uh, call SID is in dash 18 because that has the work of addressing all the discusses behind it, but the discusses are still there. And the status is a D follow up, which is really weird because we are actually waiting for for the the other ADs and not not the responsible AD. So um, continue uh, discussion of course. It as I said, all discusses are addressed in dash eighteen, and we replied to Ben and to Rob um, about uh, three weeks ago. And uh, well, we, we didn't get a speed record medal for that. The discusses actually were originally raised in July, but it took us a while to actually find out what we, we should be doing about them. Um, so these would be ready for a little bit of nagging, I think. Uh, where, where Rob may, might, might have the, the um, excuse that he would like to look at these together with Yang Siwa. So if he says that, uh, he's, he's probably right. Uh, but we haven't heard anything since those uh, uh, messages went out. And uh, uh, Zahed has uh, cleared uh, his discuss. Uh, three weeks ago, and uh, Eric has uh, cleared his discuss even earlier, but his comments haven't been uh, addressed uh, yet. So there, there definitely will be a dash 19 at some point that, that uh, addresses the remaining few uh, comments, and of course, anything we, we get back from Ben and uh, Rob. So that's the status of uh, core SID. Th thanks for that, Karsten. A uh, quick question. Um, the Ben, at least, I don't remember if Rob, Rob as well, but Ben at least had a number of comments. Are these also addressed in version 18 or is it only the discuss? Um, you can look into the mail. Um, I think we addressed most of the comments uh, in both cases for both. Okay, so but I'd, there, there I'd... may be something where where we still need some additional discussion. Yeah, I, I anyway, remember. we want to have uh, their their replies. Um, yeah. But uh, I'll take the action point of doing the nagging. It's on thank me, you. so that's yeah. why it's AD follow up. And thank you for the reminder. Good, thank you. So I think we we are in a pretty good shape here. Um, one of the the um, 
pieces of feedback was that uh, we need to have a way for uh, entities that, that are not doing uh, ITF standardization, but also are, are not large enough to actually get a mega range. Uh, so, so mom and pop shops, startups, whatever, um, these should have a way to, to actually get SIDS. And uh, our plan for most of the time was to do this in, in uh, uh, organizations like commie.space. Now we don't quite know who will actually pick up commie.space and, and perpetuate that. I would expect that, that <clears throat> some of the people who run Yang resources will be interested in that, but that work hasn't, hasn't actually um, uh, started. So that, that's one thing that to make this practical, uh, we have to address at some point. And I, I submitted a proof of concept draft that in case commie.space doesn't come live, uh, we can uh, always do this in a different uh, but less optimal way. So I think that that's a work item that, that really is an ecosystem work item and not an IETF work item that, that we need to keep active. So Yang Siba, that has a pretty substantial discuss uh, from uh, Rob Wilton, which we have mostly addressed. And we have one final to do. We have to look at about 80 occurrences of the terms schema node and data node in the document and decide which one it really is and whether we need to add the word instance or not. So that, that fell through the, the crack so far. I hope I can finish this this week. Um, but it's, it's, uh, you not only have to look at all these 80 occurrences, you also have to look at the, the, the other standards in this space and, and how they use, define and use these terms and so on. So it, it was uh, a significant uh, piece of work, but I think we now know what we want to do. So based on that, we will be able to send a reply to Rob. Uh, ben already cleared his discuss in, in October. We still have to reply to his comments. So that's the next step after the discusses are cleared. Um, Eric's uh, comment was pretty much just an, uh, oh, well, about the state of the union in, in the Yang world. <laughs> I think I can share this and a couple of thousand other oh wells. Um, then uh, Lars had some, some his usual textual comments, which were very useful, but we could just put in. Uh, Murray and uh, Eric, the other Eric, um, had some some comments which we need to reply to, and uh, uh, Roman had uh, essentially pointed to the Secvia review, which essentially said that, that everything is okay. Um, so I think we we are in good waters, but of course I would expect that Rob will have additional feedback uh, when we actually send this this message about his substantial. Uh, uh, discuss, or actually it was five discusses, and uh, yeah, I think we, we, we can um, address that. So that's the, the status. Um, th the whole thing is being organized by, by a design team that, that Mike Richardson started, and th that is currently being organized by, by Marco. And one of the useful things in this design team is that we actually have a place where where young people and, and core people can discuss things. And uh, we got significant input from, from Andy. Um, so um, this, this was really useful. And we also got input from Michel, who has been absent uh, for a while because he has other priorities at the moment, but he did uh, provide uh, very, very useful uh, input. So that, that's extremely useful. We had a couple of weekly meetings and we uh, probably will meet next on the 20th um, to, to pick up whatever we get from Rob if we get anything back by the time. Um, so the, the discussions not only helped us uh, fix uh, Yang Siba and Korsid, but we also now know a lot more about what needs to be done for Komai and, and Kor Yang library. So uh, we probably will have to keep up the design team in some form for that. 
but I think we also have solved quite a few of, of the unknowns in, in this space already. Um, technical updates resulting from the ISG comments, we finally bit the bullet and uh, uh, moved with the Yang ecosystem from RESTConf Yang data to structure extension structure. Um, so Yang originally was uh, uh, data at rest uh, modeling language only and uh, something had to be added to allow the description of data in flight. And that originally happened in the RESTConf draft, which, which is uh, probably not the right place to do that. And uh, so uh, a short while later, people came up with a structure extension, which does exactly the same thing, but does not really depend on RESTConf. So this is the kind of thing you, you want to avoid. Um, the, the ecosystem uh, impact is that the tools aren't ready for SX structure. So we had to hunt for tools to actually validate our SID file against the current <laughs> Yang uh, model. Um, Marco, I think your your microphone is making weird noises. Might will be. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, <clears throat> that was that, and we also moved the the SID file dot yang uh, towards SX structure. So it, it's the new way of doing things. Everybody's happy, but the disadvantage is, of course, that we are relying on tool support that is uh, pretty. Uh, fragile and uh, well, it probably was a wrong decision to to uh, base this on Yang in the first place. But on the other hand, Yang people would have been surprised if we didn't. So uh, yeah, uh, we made the made the module name mandatory in the SID file. Uh, th there might have been corner cases where where you don't need to put in a module name, uh, but we actually decided we don't really need a SID file for these corner cases. Uh, so th this is about netconf uh, protocol elements also receiving SIDs, and you probably just want to state that somewhere in a document instead of uh, coming up with a SID file, which is not quite the, the right shape. Uh, so we just made it mandatory and, and killed the submodule name from, from the document as well. Uh, because submodules actually don't don't play any role. So submodules are already processed at the time Yang Sibo starts to look at the Yang uh, specification. Um, we added a little program. The, the SID file example has lines that are longer than, than 70 characters. So the, the, those were uh, with line breaks. And of course, JSON doesn't allow line breaks in strings. Uh, so uh, we, we were asked whether we would want to use uh, RFC 8972 line breaking. There's actually a, a Yang document on how to correctly line break overly long lines in, in Yang specifications. <laughs> no, nobody has ever uh, uh, yeah, driven that ball so far, but uh, yeah, it was needed, and we were asked whether we want to use that, but it's not that great for JSON, so we came up with our own little thing that just works great for SID files and needs a two-line program uh, to actually remove those uh, additional line breaks. We clarified that SID0 is for internal use of implementations. So when you have an implementation and, and want to indicate that something doesn't have a SID, then you set the SID to zero and we need to ex needed to exclude SID zero from interchange for that. Uh, we clarified the, the very confusing text about uh, when a Yang model update might warrant uh, creating a new SID uh, for something that, that is no longer really like the old thing. Uh, we set the SID file version to UIN32. It used to be UIN64, but if you know young JSON, that, that uh, suffers from the JSON limitation to 53-bit integers. So UIN64s look weird. And um, so we, we worked around that by going to UIN32, hoping that no SID file will ever have more than 2 million, um, actually 4, 4 billion. Uh, versions. 
And finally, as I said, we, we uh, put in this proof of concept draft, which is not even mentioned by the uh, other drafts, but which shows how to do the the small citizen SID allocation in case there is not an organization like Comedot Space, based on private enterprise numbers, which I think everybody in the management space has. So that's my summary for CoreConf. Any questions on that? Did we lose Michael already? Yes, we did. More Good. of a, a question. Um, so you were saying that, I didn't understand completely, you were saying that you have uh, dealt with all these cases for the documents in ISG evaluation right now, but is there a different, like, is there a, a new version plan for the comments or are the comments also included? This um, I didn't get. Many comments are included. <laughs> Dash, Yang Siva dash 18 isn't out yet, and th that will have the yes. final edits right. for for this cast. So when when dash 18 is out, what you said is true. Uh, but okay. we, we expect to have another round with minor feedback from the yeah, of course, if there is answers from the ADs, that that right. might be another. And, but and the comments we, that are that are there now, they're addressed. You no, you can hear uh, them. The, 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 there are a few comments um, where we probably still need to make a minor adjustment in, in Dash 19. Okay. Uh, so we, 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 the, the problem really is that uh, uh, you, you can make GitHub issues as, as much as you want, uh, but you only really <laughs> find out whether you have addressed a comment when you uh, send back the email. Uh, responding mm -hmm. to that uh, comment. So yeah, I, I expect to have some minor uh, things in Dash 19, in, in the Dash 19s of the two documents okay. uh, that, that uh, relate to okay, these but comments. It's not uh, like for now, the, uh, for now you consider that the comments that are there right now have been addressed in, or will be addressed by version 18. Yes. Uh, so if you look at the, the slide four, uh, so for instance, Roman has a comment where, where we are really not sure whether we have covered that. So okay. we will need to wait for, for Roman to tell us. So is this also a nag? Do we also, do I also need to get an answer from Roman as well? Or well, we first have to send him an answer so you can nag. Okay. Nag, I thought Michael's reply Michael was or, or me. Well, yes, we had some some partial discussion, but that thread kind of dried out, and I want to do an official, complete response okay. uh, that that actually, I mean, it, it, it's it's easy in, in in an ISG reply to 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 take off on a tangent, and then you have <laughs> essentially finished a mail thread, but you haven't finished processing the comments, and this is exactly yeah. what happened here. Okay, good. That I know. Thank you. Good. Any more questions? Then let me quickly go to the concise resource identifiers. We had a pretty extensive discussion at IETF 112, um, which uh, um, I think I, I don't want to uh, repeat here. And th there were some open issues uh, in the 112 discussion that we haven't really uh, addressed uh, yet. Uh, but that doesn't, th these are issues about the, the best way to use these things, not, not about the definition of um, uh, CRIs. So um, we, we had a DESHO 8 for the IETF 112 uh, meeting, which was uh, pretty much complete, but not yet polished in, in every, um, aspect, and we since did a couple of editorial things, uh, but in particular, we, we added CDDL features for two things that not every CIA implementation actually may want to include. So authority-less 
uh, URIs. I'm not talking about authorityless URI references. That that's of course the normal thing to have. But authorityless URIs like URNs or, or DIDs, that's not something that that every implementation may want to uh, care about. And the percent encoded text extension we came up with uh, recently, that's probably also something that not everybody wants to support. And talking about the percent encoded text, uh, we recognize these are actually byte strings. They are not text strings because you can do weird things in a percent encoded uh, text. You essentially can send binary data along. So we went ahead and just said, okay, so these are byte strings. Uh, which uh, actually allowed us to to simplify the definition of of percent encoded text a bit because it's now clear that text string is is non encoded and byte strings is encoded so the, the we, you no longer have to count uh, from the start whether you are looking at at encoded and non encoded uh, text and uh, while we were doing that we also allowed to percent encoded text in a fragment. Uh, component. Uh, the, the, I left that off, uh, off in my original proposal, but there is no reason to leave this off because uh, percent encoded text is allowed in uh, fragments. So we, we are still making sure that our implementations actually work with the text that is um, uh, in there. And uh, I would assume that we will submit a dash 09 with these these uh, changes, which are technical changes, but not really very wide ranging ones, uh, so people have have a clean implementation uh, draft. Uh, they they can um, update the implementations too. And uh, for instance, th there is now an uh, application oriented extended diagnostic notation implementation in C C Diag. And I want to integrate CRIs into that. I've done most of the work, but I have to make sure that the CRIs actually fit with what will be dash 09. So that, that's one of the things that uh, will will happen before and after uh, 09. So we will prepare that uh, before 09, but then make sure that, that uh, everybody is happy with that. And in the process of doing that, there, there's also some test vectors that, that Thomas uh, Fasati built out of some some very early test vectors that I had been using, which I again had built out uh, test vectors that Klaus had originally uh, supplied. Uh, so we we are working on getting uh, this uh, ready uh, for release. So that's all I have. Thank you, Carson. Any comment, question, anyone? If no, thanks again. And we can move on to the key update for OSCOR presentation. Uh, Ricard, as you wish, I can share or you can share. Maybe you could share if you have it. Sure. Uh, right there, yeah. Yes. You should see them now. Yes, I see them. So, yes, hello everyone. So, I will be giving some updates on this draft key update for OS Core, uh, which we have named Kudos. Um, yeah, some updates and open points since the last presentation on this. So, uh, next slide, please. Just as a recap, so this uh draft basically uh, is split into two parts and the general problem we started from is the fact that OS core uses AAD algorithms and there is a document now in CFRD uh, defining certain limits that you need to uh, observe when you're using AAD algorithms and these limits are in terms of how many times you use a key to encrypt data and how many times you use a key to um, where uh, decryption, fail, uh, decryption fails. 
And if you reach this limit, you must rekey your keys because otherwise uh, this excessive use of the same key can enable breaking uh, security properties of these algorithms. So that was the starting point. And then basically there's two parts of this draft. And the first part is um, the study of the AAD limits and their impact on OS core. And this is about defining appropriate limits for a variety of algorithms. And this is also based on uh, formulas presented in that CFRD document. And we also define how OS core should deal with these limits in terms of having counters in a security context, what you should do uh, when you do the message processing, uh, what you should do when these limits are reached. Uh, and then we have the second part, which will be the focus of today, which is more about the uh, new way of rekeying OS core, the kudos method. And this is a method loosely inspired by the appendix B2 of OS core. And the goal here is just to, yeah, we want to generate, uh, renew the master secret and master salt, which will then um, result in deriving new sender and recipient keys from those. And one property we have here of this kudos procedure is that we can achieve a perfect forward secrecy. And next slide, please. So yes, as an overview of the key update procedure. Um, it's based on the client and server exchanging two nonces, R1 and R2. And then we have defined a function update CTX that uh, derives new OS core context using those nonces. And you can see on the right hand side, the client initiated version of this procedure. There's also a server initiated version. And yeah, essentially like the nonces will be exchanged in this field of the OS core option we defined that's called ID detail. So you indicate the presence of the ID detail with the flag bit. And then in the ID detail, you can put, uh, the client puts uh, nonce R1 and the server puts uh, in the response nonce R2. And then using these nonces, you can end up deriving a new security context, uh, which is your final context to use then uh, for future communication with that pair. And as you can see in the picture on the right in the middle, there's also an intermediate context CTX1 that you will use uh, as part of this procedure. Uh, yes, because you don't want to start over from your old context, because then if you rebooted, well, you will have this uh, nonce and key reuse that you should really derive a, a new one also for that first message you send to the other side. Um, next slide, please. Right, and then I go into some of the open points then I wish to talk about today. So the first point is how and if can we preserve observations after key update? There are different alternatives here for preserving observations if we wish to do so. Second point is uh, a key update procedure, uh, let's say a new mode of kudos where you don't have perfect oral secrecy. And this can be good for devices that may not be able to write to persistent memory because the current main mode we have defined of kudos, you need to save your new master secret and master salts to have them accessible after reboot. But of course, some devices may not be able to do that. The third point is uh, uh, a new a possibility to also renew and update your sender and recipient IDs. And these can either be part as part of the kudos execution, or it can be as a standalone procedure. You just wish to update sender and recipient IDs only. And next slide, please. So the first point here is about keeping observations. So the problem here is that what can happen is um, described in this scenario that defines the problem is that if a client starts an observation, calling it observation one, by sending a request one with request partial IV X, then the two peers run kudos and reset their standard sequence number back to zero. Now, later on, because this observation would still be ongoing, the client sends a new request, request two, also with partial, uh, with request partial V uh, X. So yeah, it's using the same partial V because it reset its standard sequence number back to zero. And now the problem here is that if this observation one is still ongoing um, and request two is also has been sent, then a response 
would cryptographically match both request one and request two. So it would match both that first observation and the second request um, because there's nothing um, in the cryptographic from that point of view that distinguishes them as they have the same the same uh, partial ID and all the same other information, um, like for instance, in the external ID. And the current approach we have the decided upon, let's say, or for now, is to terminate observations after completing kudos. But if we want to keep observations, there are two possible alternatives, which we have named, which we have named is long jumping or skipping of sender sequence numbers. And we need to make it so that whatever approach is chosen has to apply to all observations and all key updates, because the two peers need to be synchronized on what to do. There's not really an opportunity to negotiate or freely decide. We should define one way that they should follow both of them in all cases. Next slide, please. So the first approach here is the long jumping approach. And um, this is also something we presented earlier and mentioned, and this is when after a key update, the client wants to send a request. So what it should do is look at all ongoing observations, determine the highest partial IV among all those ongoing observations in the requests of the corresponding observation. And then it should jump and put, put its sender sequence number to this highest partial IV plus one. So in that way, you avoid this reusage of the same partial V of an ongoing observation. Now, the pro of this is that you don't need to take any special action for every outgoing request. You only need to, right after kudos has been run, you do this jumping of the sender sequence number. And after that, you don't have to do any particular action for every single request. Uh, the con is that you make multiple uh, sender sequence number values unusable which leads to um, yeah, use of large size values on the wire. So you get extra overhead because this will be part of those corruption. And uh, yeah, essentially you get extra, um, extra communication overhead because you jump forward like this and you basically skip on a number of uh, theoretically usable sender sequence numbers. So this is the long jumping approach. And next slide, please. And then there's also this skipping approach, which was based on some uh, feedback we received. And basically in this um, approach, instead of skipping forward to the highest uh, partial of any ongoing observation, the client instead holds a list of each individual request partial V among the observation requests that it currently has. So it's not just the highest one, basically you keep a list of all the request periods of any observation that are ongoing. And before sending any request, you should check if your if the current sender sequence number is in this list. And if it is in the list, you should just increment its sender sequence number. And of course, check again if it's in the list. And as soon as it then finds a value that's not in the list, it uses this partial V in the OSCOR option of the request. So here it's more like you, you keep track of the partial list individually and skip them individually rather than just skipping forward to the highest uh, partial IV. The pro here is that there's no long jump, so you don't have this waste of sender sequence number values. Instead, you, um, you selectively skip only the taken ones. Another pro is, yeah, you get, then you avoid this extra communication overhead because you use um, very uh, large partial IVs as as um, as compared to the long jumping approach. Uh, the con though is that for each individual outgoing request, you have to check this list. So you need some special processing for each individual request uh, as opposed to the young, long jumping approach where you just have to do this long jumping once. Uh, so here's the open question is, yeah, what, what is the best uh, option, let's say, is it simply terminating them? Is it doing the long jumping or skipping or any potential for the ones? And I see Christian has his hand raised. Um, I don't have a good answer yet. I'd just like to point out that we don't really have to consider the observations that are current, but also any observation um, that, was, that has occurred previously. 
unless the server has explicitly acknowledged having terminated that observation within I, I that bit, message has gone out of the window. I'm not sure if it's just me, but I have a bit of a problem hearing you. Yeah, you're very quiet, Christian. Um, better now? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to point out that it's not only the current observations, but it's also mm -hmm. observations that happened earlier until until the point where the server has acknowledged them being terminated, which may or may not happen explicitly. Yeah, it's basically, yeah, right. So yeah, of course, yes, I think I understand your point. So it's any observation from the, the start of the lifetime of the device, essentially, even if you go through multiple rekeyings, it's all those ongoing observations until they are terminated, either be, yeah, by the client or the server. So yes, it's not just one, you know, it's not just running, then kudos, then all ongoing observation. It can be multiple in executions of kudos. And this list of ongoing observations are all of the observations from the start, uh, say start of the lifetime of the device, essentially. Yeah. That's true. That's true. So it, it, exactly, that's the intent here. That it's all those all long observations, really all of them. Yeah, I see Karsten also has his hand raised. Yeah. So th th that means that the, the the client really has the option to terminate the observations. Uh, so th there is no waste of SN SSN values when when the client does that, right? Uh, true, right? You could just say that every time you run kudos, you terminate all observations, and then yes, indeed, there's no waste at all because you just start over from sender sequence number zero, and you don't waste any of them at all. That's true. So you do, yeah. going for that plus plus the long jump approach would essentially leave the option with the client to decide whether wasting SSNs is a problem or not. Right, so you're saying you could combine them, so the client has a choice either to terminate the observations or it can choose to uh, do the long jumping. And then if it sees, oh, I have to lock, uh, uh, I have to jump very long, it could just terminate that observation instead. So that's like a hybrid yeah. approach. Then. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it's, it's the same text in the spec, but uh, the the implementation approach, you have several implementation approaches of de dealing with the pros and cons. So no added complexity in the spec, but different ways of handling the pros and cons. Mm, all right, you're saying like the, in a sense, the long jumping could be a, an option, optional way to handle it. And if you don't want to go for that, you could just say that, okay, I just terminate all the observations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Karsten, do you also have a preference for long jumping over skipping? I guess. Well, looking at that list of SSNs, I have to avoid each time I'm making a request. That sounds onerous. Mm. So yes, I, I have a preference for doing the long jump mm. as, right. as the thing that, that you need to do if you don't terminate your observations. Right. Still yeah. O of, it would be still O of 1 if that list is sorted. Yeah, so you think it's not really a heavy, uh, a heavy operation in that sense. It's just you have to do it for each request as opposed to the long jumping one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but okay, the thing is, so we can definitely explore this kind of hybrid way where you would say that, uh, you know, the choice is to terminate, but if if you don't want to do that, you can you can uh, implement one of the other two options. And then I understand Carson had the preference for the long jumping one. Yes. All right. Um, so of of yeah. course, a related question is, um, you are probably doing this uh, because the numbers run out. So you 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 still you are still interested in these uh, observations, and um, in, uh, independent of uh, which of these uh, approaches one uses, of course, the the rekeying is a little bit of. Uh, a disruptive event in in the uh, relationship between the client and the the server. Uh, so I think we may want to spend some some effort uh, there, understanding what this would mean, for instance, for 
for an application that has a real time requirement uh, here and uh, is, is the rekeying going to throw the uh, real time operation off? Um, I think it, it's worth uh, looking at that. Mm -hmm. Like to try to minimize how disruptive how disruptive this procedure is to run between two peers, yeah. Yeah, do that, but also describe how disruptive mm -hmm. it, it still is. Uh, I mean, we probably won't right. get this completely seamless, are we? Yeah, there's of course like questions like like for instance, while you do this procedure, you probably shouldn't be sending other requests in the in, like. So you should probably have this as some kind of. Uh, atomic, like the, the update procedure should, that may be cost disturbances if you want to send requests while you're doing this procedure. So you may need to wait for it to finish. And yeah, we could describe more details on that. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really most, mostly concerned about notifications that uh, need to be dealt with at the time that, that the mm -hmm. uh, rekeying is happening. And of course, see, terminating right. the, the observations handles that problem nicely, but then it uh, does uh, introduce a discontinu discontinuity in, in the uh, up to then smooth flow of notifications. Yeah, so it does feel like it, it makes sense to have the possibility of keep observations because you would probably be, be like you said, you would probably be rekeying because you reach some limits. And then you would, in fact, want to keep the observations around, and uh, that could be a nice, nice if it's possible to do that. Yes. And then, sure. How do we deal with, for instance, a notification coming in, in the middle of this kudos procedure, for instance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for the feedback on this. Uh, then we can probably move, unless someone has something more, we can move to the next slide. Yes, so now it's about the new mode of kudos here where we do not have perfect forward secrecy. And this is something that was raised on the core mailing list. And yeah, the, the point here is this is basically a proposed alternative kudos mode that where we don't have perfect forward secrecy. And the benefit and the point of doing this is that would allow, uh, allow the procedure to be stateless across your boots like the score appendix B to is currently. So you would not need to store the master secret and master salt, your new master secret and master salt, you would not need to store that to persistent memory. Uh, and this is of course, um, having the option to be stateless is good for constrained devices that cannot store this information to persistent memory. And they may not have that possibility, right? So what we have defined so far is, in this proposed update or extension is um, enabling the selection of the no PFS mode. And this is to be done with a new bit in those core option, which we call the P bit. And if this is set to zero, we run kudos in the PFS mode, which is how basically the current um, way we have described kudos. If you set it to one, we run it in the non PFS mode. And then we have some concept we defined with his, the first concept is the bootstrap master secret and bootstrap master salt. And this is basically, if these are provisioned, these are material that is stored on disk and never changed by the device. So this could be something uh, provisioned by the factor, for instance, uh, one time, and then you have that on your disk uh, and the device never updates it itself. And then the other concept is the latest master secret and latest master salt. And this is the information from the latest derived of score security context. And this should be stored on disk by a device capable to do so. And yeah, this latest material is basically in the, in the current kudos. When you update your master secret master salt after you run kudos, that is the latest master secret master salt. And then you can store that to disk so that after reboot, you can reload it and continue using those values. Um, Next slide, please. And so basically here we define like, if a device reboots, what should it, what step should it take? What should it do uh, considering this new mode? So if you reboot, you should first check if you have a latest master secret and latest master salt saved to disk. 
Um, so it basically, if you are capable to save that, you should have saved that. And if you have it, you use that content to derive those core context CTX old. And CTX old is what we call the input to the kudos procedure. And after then, after you have rebuilt CTX old, you run kudos as initiator. And that's basically how things are currently. Uh, but now, if you do not have this latest Spencer secret and latest Spencer salt because you were a constrained device and you simply couldn't store that, then you should rather check if you have the bootstrap master secret and bootstrap master salt. And if you do have that information, you instead use this to derive the new score context CTX old, and then you run kudos as initiator based on that context as input. And if you didn't, and, and like if you don't have uh, bootstrap master secret and bootstrap master salt either, then you should run something else like addoc because you don't have any material to build a no score context in the first place right away. You need something more like addoc. Next slide, please. So if this PPT is set, then you will run kudos in the no PFS mode. So again, yeah, we sacrifice PFS because at least one of the peers is unable to save to persistent memory. And what you would do then before running kudos, you may need to modify CTX old such that the master secret is the bootstrap master secret and the master salt is the bootstrap master salt. So this means that every execution of kudos between these peers will always consider the same secret and salt pair and then hence no perfect for the secrets is ensured anymore. Uh, however, we still have all the other properties of kudos uh, compared to Oscar Appendix B2, like uh, yeah, keeping the ID context and etc. We have a list of those properties uh, in the draft. And so essentially what you would do here, even, even if you're capable to store the latest master ticket and latest master salt, if you run kudos in the non-PFS mode, rather than using this latest information you have saved down, you instead revert back to the bootstrap material. And yeah, again, this mode of kudos requires a pair to have the bootstrap master secret and bootstrap master salt, which practically implies the other pair also has them because otherwise that setup wouldn't have worked in the first place. I mean, you have to then assume that things are consistently defined so that if one pair has the bootstrap master secret and salt, the other one has it too so that they can practically communicate with OSCOR in the first place. Um, yeah, and I see we've got some feedback in the chat also. And next slide, please. So now if the PPT is set to zero, then you run kudos in the perfect for secrecy mode as things are defined in the draft today. So you use the security context CTX old without modification and the perfect core secrecy is preserved. And yeah, devices that can write to persistent memory, we should initiate the procedure with P set to zero. So if you're a device that can write to disk, you should first of all write the latest master secret and latest master salt to disk. And secondly, you should always initiate kudos with perfect core secrecy uh, as a initial attempt right now there may be the case that even though you can write to disk and you can run it with pfs mode the other pair cannot so you need a way to agree to downgrade uh, so what would, could happen is an initiator sets the p to zero uh, and because it wants to run kudos with pfs and the responder may not be able to uh, write to disk and thus it cannot run kudos in mode P0. So if the responder here is a server, it can return a protected 503 error response, setting the P bit to one to indicate that it wants to use, that it must in fact use P1. If the responder is a client, it can send a protected request two with P set to one. Uh, because yeah, both client and server can be initiated or it depends if the client and server is a responder, but essentially you would respond and set in the OSCAR option set P to one to indicate that you want to run kudos in P uh, one mode without PFS. And in either case, you should abort this kudos execution. So this particular execution didn't work out, but then as a next step, 
right away, the initiator may retry setting P to one. And then it basically, you, so you, you have to downgrade to respect the least capable device. Um, so the question here is, is this over a good, overall a good approach and a way forward uh, to define this new mode at all and to define it in this manner? That's an open point. Any feedback on that? Yeah, I did see uh, Karsten had some message there in the chat. I saw that one. Yeah, that, that was just a joke because if you're a hardware person, you haven't told that when, when <clears throat> zero means it's on and one is off, you mark the bit with uh, uh, over ah, one. Okay. Uh, okay. But I think we, we are not quite there yet with RFCs to mm, do that. Right, right. Uh, so the, the I think um, I'm not sure I, I fully understood the agreed downgrade. So the, the, there is no way to actually do a downgrade attack here, right? Yeah, we actually had uh, 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 a lot of discussions on that uh, um, in Marco, and no, we believe that there is no way to do a downgrade attack the way we have defined things now, because initially we had the uh, or three um, not protected. So we actually did some modifications to the message flow, explicitly trying to stop and uh, avoid the possibility of any downgrade attack. So basically, the way that, um, like, even if well, we have more material on this that we we can go into and document uh, more in the draft, of course, but essentially, like, even if an adversary tries to drop a message or modify the P bit in the OSCOR option it should not be able to perform a downgrade attack because you need this protected 503 error response message. And that's the way of saying, I wish to downgrade. And unless mm -hmm. you see that this is a protected response, you, you do not actually downgrade as an initiator. You need this explicit confirmation from the other party in a protected message that it wants to downgrade. Otherwise, you never go for the downgrade. And the same case in the client responded, uh, scenario that you need, if you're an in initiator as a server, you want to see a protected request to with P set to one from the client. So we, we made it, so you really need this explicit confirmation in a protected request uh, for, uh, for, for you to actually do the downgrading. But the OSCOR option itself is not protected unless you're running OSCOR. So the request as a whole might be protected, but that that single bit might not be. Right, but I think it's it then true, I, I agree. Um, however, like you, the thing is, I don't, I mean, the only reason you would send this protected fire error response is if you wish to downgrade, right? Otherwise you would just run kudos normally. So in the server responded scenario, for instance, you would never send this protected 503 with P set to one unless you wish to downgrade. And then sure, an attacker could flip the one to zero, maybe, but that that wouldn't make sense from the pro from the from the point of view of how we define things. Um, so so it's more like the, um, the 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 fact that you get this protected fire tier response came an indication to to downgrade, uh, and you would only get that like if the if the other party wishes to downgrade. But this is probably something we, we should define the, and, and this, describe the current material we have uh, in greater detail and, of course, start putting material in the draft about this. Because this is, of course, an important point that there's absolutely no chance to form a downgrade attack. But from what we analyzed and from what we updated um, in the message flow, it seems that there shouldn't be a way right now. Yeah. But any more feedback on this is very welcome, yeah. Okay, I think then if there's no more feedback on this point, we can go to the next slide. Uh, I didn't want to interrupt the flow. I'm just reeling a comment from Christian uh, in the minutes on the previous part um, of the presentation. Mm -hmm. And it was mentioned about um, thinking well also what can cannot be done while a key update is uh, ongoing. Mm -hmm. So Christian just said, uh, yes, think about it, but uh, there may be a way to um, remain able to send messages uh, even during a key update, if I understood the comment correctly. 
yeah, that's definitely something we can co we can consider. And then I guess the question is like, practically, what context would you use? I guess still the old context, and then we should define in more detail exactly how that, what context you should use to send that request, for instance. Yeah, but that's interesting. That would be nice to be able to enable that. Of course, in some situations, you may need to. Um, there may be cases where you need to send messages, even though the procedure is ongoing. Yeah. So if we can enable that, that may be nice. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Next slide, please. Right. And this is the third and last point, then, which is about renewing sender and recipient IDs, basically changing sender and recipient IDs. So this is also based on discussions on the mailing list. Can see the links there in two and three and the the procedure we have defined for this uh, update uh, has a number of properties so essentially each endpoint can specify its own new recipient id which is similar to how ad hoc does things and you need to explicitly conform and accept the update of the sender recipient ids and it's optional to accept this you can embed this procedure within a kudos execution, or you can run it standalone. Both client and server can initiate the procedure. And of course, changing these IDs would practically trigger a derivation of a new, of course, security context with new recipient and sender keys, because uh, the, the IDs are uh, input to that derivation procedure. And an important point here is you must not do this immediately following a reboot. You must run kudos first uh, because if you run this immediately following a reboot you'll just be reusing your old security context which then is launching here usage so you cannot do that you must in that case if you have rebooted you must run kudos first for instance kudos um, now there may be an exception here which is if you have oscar appendix b1 because then you can reboot and uh, reload a safe sender sequence number to continue using so in that case um, that's kind of a, a small open point if we should admit that exception if use of score appendix b1 is is uh, safe and i see christian raise his hand i think it will be easier to face this using loss of state and defining which state is lost which i think here is the knowledge of which recipient ids have been used in this context before uh, again, I have a bit of a trouble hearing you, but maybe you could note that in the minutes or yeah. if you yeah, yeah. please. Thanks. Yes, but thank you for the feedback. And next slide, please. Yeah, so basically the way this procedure happens is that we define the new co-op option that you use to carry your desired new recipient ID. And we propose here option number 24 because it has the properties we desired. And yeah, the content of this option is pretty simple. It's the new recipient ID that the message sender wants to have. And of course, you should pick and offer a free recipient ID for the particular ID context you're using to avoid colliding, uh, having collisions of the recipient ID and ID context. So, you know, pick a free value and offer that one. And it's class E for OSCORE processing. And here you can see the, yeah, the definition of the option, let's say. And um, one open point here is, is it fine for this to be an elective option? Uh, the intent there was to have it optional to accept or not. So even if you get a request containing or a response containing this option, you may simply, either whether you understand the option or not, you can simply ignore it and continue sending responses with your current uh, security context uh, and actually react going through this update procedure. So that's one open point if it's fine to be elective. And another open point is, is there a better way than defining a new co-op option? Um, yeah, so any feedback on those points would be appreciated. Otherwise, we can go to the next slide. Yeah, and here basically you can see the message flow of the 
this update procedure of the sender and SIP entities. And this is a message flow where the client is initiating the procedure. And this is the standalone message flow. So this is when it's not embedded within a kudos execution. When it's embedded in a kudos execution, um, it's yeah, it, we have a we have material on that too, but that that's let's say makes it a longer procedure. So here's just a standalone version. And yeah, essentially you see the client, it's split into two parts also, but if you look at the left side first, the client starts with context A, sender ID one, recipient ID zero, and the server has, has the same but mirrored. Now the client sends a request just as normal, protected with CTXA. Uh, however, it includes this recipient ID option indicating value 42. The server receives this request and protects it with the CTXA, the shared context, just as normal. Uh, but in the response, the server now also includes a recipient ID option indicating 78. And by the way, in both request one and response one, they can also, of course, have normal application data. Um, and so essentially, they each tell each other what they want their new recipient ID to be. And after this request one and request, after request one and response one, when they have exchanged this information, they both derive new contexts so that now the client derives CTXB with sender ID 78 and recipient ID 42, according to the values exchanged. And similarly, the server derives a uh, CTXB also with the value swapped. Now the uh, client sends a request simply protected with CTXB, and this is just a normal OSCO request. And now, basically, at this point, you have you have done your swapping of sender, uh, you have done your renewal of sender and recipient IDs, and you can just proceed to communicate as normal. The only thing that is a bit sensitive is when you can safely delete the old contexts. So you see that after response two has been received, the client can delete context A, and after request three has been received, the server can delete context A. And yeah, it's a bit sensitive to not delete them too early so you don't get into a kind of a deadlock situation where you deleted a context that you would in fact, because of course, if this procedure fails in the middle, you would have to revert back to CTXA. So that's a bit sensitive. Um, yeah, so any feedback on this uh, general idea and the way we have suggested to implement it is very welcome. Otherwise, please uh, can go to the next slide. Yeah, and then it's about next steps we should take with this draft. So. Continuing to addressing open points and issues, we have a number of issues on the um, that we should transfer over now to the new repository. Uh, yeah, we want to further refine the key limits. Of course, we're also working on that in parallel. Although this talk was about kudos, uh, and of course, also continue to work on the kudos procedure and now its extensions, uh, like the non PFS mode. And uh, we wish also to add some more applicable uh, considerations from those score appendix B two text. And another open point was which kudos messages can contain actionable payload. Uh, like when is it safe to, in a request or response, to include payload that you wish the other party to actually act upon? Uh, so that's also an open question. How, how yeah, when is that safe? Like right now, for instance, in the client initiated version, we say that in request one and response one, for instance, you do not have any actionable payload. That's just messages dedicated exclusively for running the kudos procedure. And yet another open point here is to uh, to work on implementing this in code, basically. And that would be essentially on on top of the California Java library and the current OSCORE implementation we have there. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. Thank you for listening and thank you for all the feedback. And here you see the link now to the updated, to the new repo for this draft. And yeah, any further feedback uh, now or via mail or other channels is of course welcome. Thank you, Ricardo.
Thank you. Any more comment, input on this document? You no, know, uh, we are on the AOB. Uh, so this was the, the last interim for this year as an extra one after ITF 112. And of course we plan to uh, resume next year uh, on January 19, uh, as usual, uh, every other Wednesday. It's going to be four interim meetings before ITF 113 and we alternate with Cibor. Uh, all is scheduled already. Hopefully Miteco will work will work well with the new year. Um, anything else you want to add more for today? No, so thank you very much, Christian, for helping with the minutes. <laughs> really appreciate it. And thank you for today for your great work in core. Uh, if we don't talk to you anytime soon, wish you a very nice holiday season and talk to you in January. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.